<clears throat> Hello, everyone. My name is Alberto Costa. I work for Cambridge Assessment English as a Senior Assessment Services Manager. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the CEFR 20 years later. And we're going to talk about how these international language standards impacted language learning. Well, before I continue, I would like to thank Epi for inviting me to speak at this event again. I hope you have a good day and that you enjoy all the sessions. So uh, the Common European Framework or the CEFR came into place 20 years ago in 2021. But the reason why I'm bringing this topic today, it's because in Brazil, there are some changes now to bilingual education. And I'm going to start by giving you an outline of um, this document, which is now part of our education, right? They are the Diretrizes Curriculares para Oferta de Educação Plurilingüe. So this document now um, establishes that teachers and learners, uh, they need to achieve certain language levels in order for the school to uh, fit into the category of either bilingual schools or schools with extended learning hours. There are some specificities about those schools nowadays. So if any school wants to uh, become bilingual or wants to become a school with extended learning hours, they need to make sure they meet some of the requirements according to the directrices, right? Um, I'm also going to talk about those language levels for teachers and for learners in bilingual schools in Brazil. And uh, I will give you an overview of the new Common European Framework of Reference Companion Volume, which was launched last year, and which brings a number of new things to the document. For example, the new Companion Volume will bring some new language descriptors. We're going to see some of those descriptors here in those new areas. And we're going to end by talking about the implications for the classroom. And I, I will be happy to share some references with you, right? So last year, this document became um, uh, valid in Brazil. Well, the document still needs its final approval, which is a signature from, from the president. But this is the document uh, that uh, schools are now uh, reading and trying to understand to make sure they meet all the requirements if those schools want to become bilingual schools or if they want to become a school with extended learning hours, right? But the document starts by giving um, this um, history of bilingual and plurilingual education in Brazil. So it will talk about at the beginning, educação indígena, educação de surdos, educação em regiões de fronteiras, it will bring analysis about uh, some legal um, um, points related to uh, bilingualism and plurilingualism. It will also talk about some of the initiatives in terms of bilingual education in Latin America. And we'll go on to talk about plurilingual education and the NCC, right? The second part of the document will bring some recommendations to the Ministry of Education and a project. Uh, for the schools, um, uh, a project with requirements for the schools who want to uh, consider themselves officially bilingual uh, as long as they meet those requirements. So according to the document, there are some professional development um, uh, opportunities for teachers. So the document, uh, doesn't change anything in terms of the minimum requirements for you to become a teacher in basic education in Brazil. So according to the age ranges and the, the phases uh, you are teaching. So uh, requirements such as letras, pedagogia, licenciaturas, they all apply, nothing has changed in that matter. However, if you are teaching in a bilingual school, according to the new, um, guidelines, you need to make sure that you do this extension course with a minimum of 20, 120 hours. And this course is a complementary training in bilingual education 
because uh, up to this point, uh, teachers leave, uh, teach in schools, in universities and faculties uh, without special training for bilingual education in their initial degree, right? There is also a requirement in terms of language proficiency. So teachers need to demonstrate uh, officially that they have a minimum level of English, level B2, according to the Common European Framework of Reference, in order for them to teach in those contexts, right? Bilingual schools and schools with extended learning hours. So uh, one important thing to say here, the document doesn't say which exam the teacher has to sit, but the teacher has to prove that they have achieved level B2 minimum through some sort of certification, right? So also the document establishes some language proficiency levels for learners. For example, uh, in those schools, one of the requirements is that learners uh, reach level uh, A2 minimum when they come to sexto ano do ensino fundamental, or that they reach uh, level B1 in the Common European Framework in non one ensino fundamental, that is 80% of the students minimum, right? And of course, that uh, when they get to the third one, the ensino medium, they should reach level B2 in the CFR, remembering that the minimum requirement for teachers is level uh, B2. However, if those schools are to prepare learners to reach level B2 in Tercero One of the Ensino Medio. This means that it's very important that teachers teaching those students are at a higher level, not B2, right? Because you need some language uh, skills and you need uh, this self confidence to develop the language skills in the learners, right? But when we look at those levels, A1, A2, B1, B2, um, many of us teachers, we understand where they come from, but this is not something that is well known by the majority of the society. So where do those letters and numbers come from? They form part of this Common European Framework of Reference for Languages, which was launched in 2001. And after it was launched, there was a huge impact in language teaching, learning, and assessment. Um, nowadays, um, if you are studying uh, an additional language, not just English, uh, this is, those letters and numbers are the levels that you need to, to show that you have achieved in your language learning, right? So if you have achieved level A2, B1, B2, Certificates, um, uh, language certificates, uh, be they uh, Cambridge certificates or Delphi and Delphi certificates for French or Celpi Bras in Brazil, uh, they also follow uh, those levels in order to make sure that they can assess uh, learners' uh, language skills at those specific levels as well, right? So, um, because the document was launched in uh, 2001, after 20 years, many things changed in our society, many things changed in language learning, teaching, curriculum. Also, uh, a lot of things have happened uh, in terms of research for language learning, teaching, bilingual, plurilingual education, but also um, uh, the way we communicate uh, changed a lot in those 20 years. So here, us, here is a summary of, some of those changes that happened in those 20 years and that have been taken into consideration in the new version of the CFR, which was launched in 2020, the companion volume, right? So uh, there were changes uh, in technology, for example, uh, the new volume has updated a number of references, things like communication through postcards or using public phones. They don't appear in the new version anymore because hardly do we use those things nowadays, right? 
Also, um, there are uh, descriptors for phonological control. So they have added descriptors of phonology and those descriptors focus on sound articulation and prosodic features. Of course, we had descriptors, descriptors for speaking skills in the first document, but now pronunciation has been given uh, due attention in this new version. There are also um, modality inclusive descriptors. So there are descriptors now for users of sign languages. So uh, understanding languages, which is not just the language the way uh, we speak, but for the users of sign language uh, and the, the translators as well. And of course, some terms have, um, have been dropped because they don't apply when we talk about language learning and teaching and especially communicating in other languages nowadays. So things like native speakers, they, they, they have dropped this term in the new document and they refer to um, people who communicate in a language or in different languages. They refer to them as users of the language or signers of the language if they use sign language or interlocutors, of the uh, or interlocutors in the target language. So because of research, because of changes in different views of language learning and teaching, changes in society, the new document will bring a number of things which we are going to look at in more depth from now on. So um, one of the things we see very clearly in this new version is the view of language. So in the previous document, the view of language was pretty much um, focused on uh, the four skills. So listening, reading, speaking, and writing. Now, uh, the new volume uh, will bring uh, um, a widened view of language and of communication, right? So they will bring, for example, uh, language skills and uh, competencies in terms of those four big areas here. So we have the area of language reception, language production, interaction, and mediation. When we talk about language reception, we are talking about both oral comprehension and reading comprehension, Language production, we are talking about oral and written production. Interaction, we have oral interaction, but also we have uh, written interaction and online interaction, which is something that we do a lot nowadays, <laughs> much more than writing per se, uh, I assume. And of course, we have the area of mediation, which brings um, this new uh, uh, insight into the way we uh, talk to people and how we mediate things when we are communicating, be it in the classroom or be it uh, uh, in other uh, circumstances like work, for example, or college. So mediation will include things like mediating a text, mediating concepts, and mediating communication. Mediation could, could happen across languages. So you could mediate content that somebody has provided to you in a language and then you kind of convey uh, this content in another language, but it could also be within the same language. So for example, content that um, a specialist would understand and then this specialist would convey this content to people who are not in the area. So kind of uh, uh, expressing the same idea in different words, making sure that the different audiences will understand those concepts, for example, or the content of a text. So other changes uh, to the levels actually include those breakdown of certain levels. We can see now in the new volume that we have officially uh, um, uh, we can now officially say level pre-A1 with competencies, of course, below level A1. And we also have the plus levels. So we have level A2, and now we have level A2 plus with specific descriptors. Same for B1, B1 plus, 
B2, B2 plus. So lots of changes, right, that have happened to the document. When we're talking about plurilingual and uh, pluricultural competence, this has been expanded uh, quite a lot in this new version. So um, the CFR now distinguishes between multilingualism, which is the coexistence of different languages at the social or individual level, and plurilingualism, which is um, the dynamic and developing linguistic repertoire of an individual user or learner, right? So nowadays, more and more, because of technology, because of mobility, uh, studies, uh, etc., there are more and more um, opportunities for people to uh, communicate, to act in plurilingual, pluricultural uh, contexts, right? So they have um, added those descriptors for plurilingual competence. So um, in terms of plurilingual pluricultural competence, uh, there are some um, focuses here in the document uh, when they refer to the ability to call flexibly upon an interrelated or uneven or plurilinguistic repertoire. So uh, if you are uh, you know, using or communicating such contexts, you know, uh, you have uh, or you demonstrate the ability to switch from one language or dialect or variety to another, right? Or you can express yourself in one language and understand a person speaking uh, another. You can call upon the knowledge of a number of languages to make sense of a text. So uh, you may uh, draw upon um, your existing knowledge of some words in a language, and then you can make sense of what someone is saying or what you are reading. You can recognize words from a common international uh, store in a new guise. So you can probably uh, see some names that are popular out in the streets, and then you can recognize those names in other texts. You can mediate between individuals with no common language. So mediation across languages. Uh, even with uh, only a slight knowledge, um, um, if that's the case. And then you can also uh, demonstrate that you can bring the whole of one's linguistic equipment into place. So you can experiment with alternative forms of expression, right? So uh, this, this will also include uh, all the images that we have added to communication as well. So here are some examples of those um, descriptors for plurilingual and pluricultural competence, right? So for example, uh, at level A1, if you are uh, communicating in this context, to be at level A1, you need to demonstrate that you can recognize internationalisms to deduce meaning of simple signs. So we have here a plurilinguistic, uh, plurilingual comprehension, sorry. Um, let's look at the third descriptor here. You can use a word from another language um, in their plurilingual uh, plurilingual repertoire to make uh, yourself understood in a routine everyday situation. So we are talking here about building this uh, plurilingual repertoire, right? Uh, when we look at the fourth descriptor here, you can extract information from documents written in different languages in uh, his or her field to include a presentation, to include in a presentation. So here we have another example of plurilingual com comprehension at level B1. Of course, these are just some samples, so it's important to refer to the document to look at the other descriptors at different levels, right? And then we're going to look at the application for the classroom. In terms of mediation, which, is all, which has also been expanded in this new version, uh, mediating is about creating bridges, right? And it's about helping to construct or convey meaning, sometimes within the same language, or sometimes across modalities, uh, for example, from spoken or sign language to written language, or vice versa, right? Or sometimes from uh, one language to another, uh, cross-linguistic mediation, um, uh, and we're going to see some of the examples here, right? 
So they gave a lot of attention to mediation in this volume. And I think this was valid um, uh, time and effort to dedicate to mediation. When we look at some descriptors for um, mediation over here, we can see them at different levels. I look at those descriptors myself and I see a lot of the work that we teachers do in our teaching practices in the classroom. So for example, uh, when we look at level B1, the descriptor here in the middle, um, if you are at level B1, you need to demonstrate that you can summarize in a language, the main points made during a conversation on a subject of personal or current interest, provided that the speakers articulated clearly in standard language. So it's about helping other people to understand the content of that interaction, right? When you look at the descriptor for level B2, for example, um, at this level, you need to demonstrate that you can relay in writing the relevant points contained in an article from an academic or professional journal. So when we look at this descriptor, for example, this is what we teachers do most of the times when we are looking for uh, texts uh, that we are going to bring to our students. But this also happens uh, at work. It happens when we are communicating with people socially as well. If you are, for example, telling someone else about the news you read earlier today, for example. So uh, I think it was very interesting that they um, gave a lot of attention to mediation because we do most of those things and as teachers, we do those things a lot. So uh, they also defined uh, some uh, activities when we're talking about mediation. Of course, all those little boxes that you can see here, they are areas for which you have a number of descriptors, but we're going to look at just a few. So we have things like mediating a text, so passing on to another person the content of a text, mediating a text for oneself. So for example, when you are taking notes because you are attending a lecture, you are mediating a text for uh, yourself. Uh, points that you don't want to forget, points that you have understood in a different way. So also expressing reaction to texts, particularly creative and literary ones. So when they're talking about creative texts, it's about the multimodal um, communication that we have nowadays uh, using not only words, but also images, moving images as well. We have the uh, areas or the activities when we are mediating concepts, for example, facilitating access to knowledge and concepts to others. When you are, for example, uh, uh, talking to a child uh, because uh, as a parent or as a teacher, you are mediating uh, concepts to, to that child. But also when you are mentoring or when you are teaching and training, you are mediating a lot of concepts all the time when you are constructing and elaborating meaning and when you are facilitating and stimulating uh, conditions that are conducive to such conceptual exchange and development, those are activities related to mediating concepts. And then we have mediating communication, which has to do with facilitating um, understanding and shaping successful communication between users or between learners, right? who may have a number of differences, be they individual, social, cultural, social, linguistic, or intellectual. Another activity here, um, participants uh, uh, who have shared um, communicative objectives, but uh, they don't uh, necessarily need to be uh, uh, the case, uh, those objectives. For example, if you are working in the area of diplomacy, uh, you are mediating a lot of uh, communication uh, between uh, people, uh, between uh, institutions such as uh, companies or even a country. Uh, when you are in negotiations, of course, you are mediating a lot of communication there. But also when you are teaching or if you need to solve a problem, there's a lot of communication that you need to mediate, right? 
So uh, I think it was important to bring uh, those points. And one last point that uh, they gave a lot of attention to was online interaction. So in this new version, they uh, describe online interaction in two major categories, online conversation and discussion. So conversation and discussion as a multi, uh, multi-modal phenomenon. So emphasis on how interlocutors communicate and uh, to handle uh, social exchanges or serious issues uh, in a way that is open-ended, but also another category, which is goal-oriented online transactions and collaboration, which is uh, different now. So this focuses on collabor- the collaborative nature of online interaction and transactions Uh, that have specific goals. So you send uh, a short message to um, a customer or to a company or to a shop, for example, because uh, you expect some sort of action and we are doing this uh, through online interaction more and more, right? So it is, uh, as they say here, a regular feature of contemporary life. Here are some descriptors for online um, com- communication in terms of online conversation and discussion. So I have here some samples of descriptors at two different levels. So at level A2, demonstrating that you can engage in basic social communication online, writing a simple message or a virtual card for special occasions or sharing news. Um, and then of course you are using all the tools available, not only words, but uh, convey messages with images as well. You can respond to those positive or negative comments. And um, when you look at level B1, uh, engaging in real time online exchanging with more than one participant, which is typical of social media, right? When you are, in online exchanges with lots of people, people you know and people you may not know. So uh, recognizing their communicative intentions and uh, also posting online uh, in um, accounts of social events or experiences and activities referring to the links and media and of course sharing personal feelings. So this is about conversation and discussion, but also there are some descriptors for online transactions and collaboration. For example, at level A2, if they can make simple online transactions, so so placing an order or enrolling in a course by providing the basic details, if they can ask basic questions about the, the availability of a product or feature at level B1, if they can engage in this online uh, collaborative or transactional exchange that requires simple clarification and explanation of relevant details. If you are registering for a course, for a tool, if you can respond to instructions and ask questions, for example, in, um, or if you want to accomplish a task uh, that, is, uh, that you are doing online. These are just, again, some samples. You can look at the descriptors for the other levels. And I think now it's very important that we consider the implications for the classroom after talking about all those additions to the new volume of the Common European Framework of Reference, right? What are those things for? Well, if we are talking about the implications for the classroom, it's important that um, we look at the view of language and that we see learners as language users and social agents. So, for example, involving them in the learning process. It's not just about teaching the language, but it's about learners becoming um, agents, uh, social agents, right? So making sure that you provide extensive use of the target language in the classroom for a range of uh, real purposes, right? It's important to see language as well as a vehicle for communication rather than a subject to study. So we are using language all the time for many different purposes through different means. So language uh, should be seen above all as a vehicle rather than a subject to study. It's important also to analyze the learner's needs and the use of can-do descriptors uh, to match learner's needs. So 
The fact that the CFR has all those descriptors, it is there as a reference. This means that you can make choices in terms of which descriptors you want to bring to your course or to your curriculum and how you're going to help learners develop those competencies in the language, in the different areas and for the different purposes. It's important also to see learners as plurilingual and pluricultural beings more and more. So make sure that you allow them to use all their linguistic resources when necessary because learners access um, different cultures and languages all the time now. Think of uh, Netflix, think of the popularity of the Korean uh, series, uh, Korean pop music, and a number of other countries and cultures and influences that come to our learners nowadays. So make sure that you encourage the learners to see similarities and regularities as well as differences between languages and cultures, right? Also, uh, get learners to uh, get engaged in collaborative tasks in the classroom whose primary focus is not the language, but some sort of um, some other um, product or outcome. For example, get them to do tasks and then they use the language for their tasks or to solve those problems. Planning a day out, making a poster, creating a blog or designing something that they can do together or choosing a candidate for a specific task or role. And also make sure that you use the, the descriptors to help design those tasks and also to observe and if desired to use those uh, descriptors for both self-assessment and for the assessment of the language use of the learners while they are performing the task. So those descriptors, they serve for language learning, teaching, and assessment above all. With that, I leave here some references because it's very important to dig into the new document and to look at those uh, new descriptors that have been added to the CFR. And I'm sure the impact of the new volume uh, will be beneficial in many ways. And last but not least, thank you very much for listening to me and congratulations, Epi, once again for putting such a beautiful event together. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.